Tuesday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today we are doing something a little bit different. Uh, traditionally, we would be releasing our uh, monthly segment, Crossing All Borders, on Wednesdays, the last Wednesday of each month. But uh, with a special episode coming out this Friday, we want to push everything up a little bit, but still have the segments on the show. So we are releasing this Tuesday morning. So happy Tuesday, everyone, and happy Tuesday to our global affairs pundit. Miss Jennifer Sanford. Jennifer, thank you so much for doing this once again. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm ready with my unpopular opinions for the week, for the that's month. What, that's what the, the show the show's become up unpopular opinions by Chris Brown and guests. So let's do this. <laughs> let's um, dive in. So as always, if you haven't tuned, if you did not tune into last month's uh, very first inaugural episode of Crossing All Borders, we are talking about Canada on the global stage international politics and international news but to start this one off because we haven't talked in the last 30 days we're going to stick a little bit closer to home to start off with and then go across the pond then back closer to home and then wherever we go and we will start with this this is the big one on October 26th, literally, I think four days after our last episode dropped or two days before the episode dropped, the Prime Minister of Canada announced his new cabinet. Uh, surprise, surprise, there were some major shuffles, one being foreign affairs. The current, the former foreign affairs minister in the last parliament was Mark Garneau, first Canadian astronaut in space. He got turfed for a younger politician, former Minister of Economic Development, Melanie Jolie. Um, before I give my opinion, I'm going to just turn the microphone over to Jen because I'm just going to walk away, go grab some coffee because I'm assuming she has some very strong opinions about this. <laughs> go ahead, Jen. What was your initial thoughts of this, this big change? Well, I want to resist the urge to drink from a fire hose on this answer. So in the spirit of going one at a time and not, not you getting a sandwich, I'll say this, you know, we know that the prime minister is interested in governing from the prime minister's office, right? We know that he is not interested in the democratic requirements of parliament. We know he's not interested um, in, you know, any sort of effort to to fundamentally participate in government the way our government has been structured right it's he and he alone and so i you know i find that this cabinet shuffle is really just the the you know the grandstanding that we're used to with with justin trudeau which is how can i find um you know people in the cabinet that will give the appearance of diversity but will basically echo whatever talking points i give them uh enter uh Jolet. Uh, enter, uh, you know, she's been a lackluster performer since she got into the cabinet. Um, you know, we like to, we, not me, but people <laughs> like to, to talk about the sort of the whole issue of parody, right? You know, she's a young woman. She's, um, you know, she's, she's going to have, you know, she's going to represent the diversity of Canada, whatever. She's a lackluster performer. She was, you know, mediocre at best in her economic portfolio before that in official languages, she was even more mediocre. Um, she has demonstrated that her greatest aptitude is repeating the talking points that she's given from the PMO. And when you look at a PMO, that's really only interested in foreign affairs through the lens of trade and don't create a problem, you know, she's a perfect fit for that reason. I think that that mitigates, you know, the tenacity of, um, of, you know, women in, in political leadership positions. I just think when we look at great representatives, um, that could fill this, this position, I don't believe that she's one of them. And I don't say that because she's a woman. I don't say that because she's young. I say that because, you know, past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. And I don't think we're going to see any innovation, anything dynamic. Uh, I think she's going to do as she's told and be a good little soldier for, for Trudeau and his, his, uh, you know, legacy of grandstanding and i i completely agree with that um i was actually shocked because i while while he was relatively new to the portfolio he was just appointed earlier this year mark garneau was doing a okay job he might not have been the most uh appropriate but he he knew his stuff and when he spoke people listened i don't think this is going to be the case when it comes to melanie jolie I think, yes, it looks like we're looking at a younger, more vibrant cabinet, but um, 
sometimes you need adults in the room and Mark Garneau was the adult in that room. And he would, from what the reports I've read and the articles I've per, uh, perused, Mark Garneau would push back. He would say, this is how we have to do it against Justin Trudeau. Absolutely. And and I think that's what happened was Justin Trudeau's looking for a yes man or yes woman. And he got it with Melanie Jolie. Yeah. And I don't think that we limit it to, to Melanie Jolie. I mean, look at the oh, new yeah. uh, defense minister. I mean, she's not there to look at military strategy. She's not there to look at defense of the Arctic. She's not there to address anything more than being the manager of sexual assault complaints. Which, And I think that she's, it's like, um, you know, we used to talk about this when George Bush was, was president, right? You know, people used to say like, this is crazy. All we want in a president is like a good steady bus driver who's had one to two, but no more than four accidents. And I think that that's what you're really looking at when you're looking at this cabinet selection is who can I control? Who will say what Katie Telford and Gerald Butts writes for them? And who will, who will allow Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland to be, you know, the mom and dad of this party? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I could spend a whole hour on Christian Freeland. I'm not going to. You and me both, buddy. I, I, I feel like we should have a, have that conversation at one day, because um, I'm I'm looking at Trudeau's last picks for foreign affairs minister. They have not been stellar. Let's put it that way. So when he first elected, Stefan Dion was the first foreign affairs minister. We all saw how well that went over. Yeah, that that, was bad. that faded out as quickly as they basically got appointed. Christia Freeland went in. She was uh, basically head to head to Trump and try to keep NAFTA under control. We all saw how well that worked out. Then Champagne was put in. Didn't really do much because most of his job was taken away from Christia Freeland who became the chief negotiator for the NAFTA uh, tr uh, trade deal. So basically, Champagne was taken out of the uh, equation of foreign affairs because our biggest partner, you didn't have to deal with your foreign affairs minister. You had to deal with your pre deputy prime minister. Garneau, he was, he was making the rounds. I think he had a good reputation across the world. And now we're back into this. I... And I I, I hate to put it this way, but it's the equivalent of Stefan Dion being back in this uh, position to me. But I think it it begets a bigger question here, which is which is what does it take to be a good minister of foreign affairs? I mean, you ha you have to imagine it would be like if you and I were hired to go in as the director of communications for an awesome organization. And then we get there and we realize that the leader of the organization doesn't understand how the money works. Uh, he doesn't understand how to build partnerships and relationships. Um, he has nothing substantive to say, like, how good are you then at your job? This is this, I think, is the big question that we get here. That's why I don't care when I saw that that uh, Melanie Jolet was was elected into this role. I just thought, who who she cares? Who cares? Because what does success look like in this role when you have the leadership and you really are governing from the leadership? You're not governing as a parliament anymore. You're governing, you're governing unilaterally as one. What, what does success really look like when the top of the, I mean, the fish stinks from the head, right? When the head doesn't know what it's doing and doesn't know what its values are and just every now and again takes barbs for no purpose, you know, I, what, what, what does success in the role look like? It, I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? I try to give new portfolios the benefit of the doubt. I gave it to Jason Copping when he was named Alberta's new Minister of Health. I give it to all these new MPs who are taking on new roles in this new cabinet. Sometimes, though, you don't... Past, past work experience is going to be what you're going to get. With Melanie Jolie, you are not going to get a strong voice for Canada in the world stage. You are not even going to get a voice on the world stage because as you've so eloquently put it, mom and dad are running the show and that's it. We have Christia Freeland and Justin Trudeau who are going to run the show for the rest of their term until either one of them resigns and the other one becomes leader or they get defeated. Yeah, I think this is up. going to, pardon me? Or it just blows up for both of them. Yeah, but I don't think it's going to blow up for her. I think it's going to blow up for him before her, but that's. Mm, I don't think she's got the electability that people think she does. 
they thought Kim Campbell did. We also held well that turned out. So oh, that's a different that's a different <laughs> thing in a different era, right? I agree. Um, but I, I but look, I think that I, I'm looking back on your your comment about leading from the sent the office, the prime minister's office. Mm-hmm. Stephen Harper did that which, quite well. Which, let's be very clear, is exactly what is happening. Exactly. And Stephen Harper did that as well, right? Stephen Harper was the was basically the forerunner of leading from the prime minister's office. He gave some slack to some ministers, but not a lot. I'm looking at the list of former foreign ministers under the conservative. I don't see a strong leader in there either. So has... Has foreign affairs in Canada just become a a throwaway portfolio? Um, well, I think, well, okay, I got to go back because I disagree about your statement that that uh, Trudeau is playing from the Harper playbook. While I do think that there's centralized power in, in both, I've never seen such a blatant disregard for the value of, of parliament as I have from, from Trudeau. And I think the difference is the intentionality to put and especially I'm going to pick on women, women in places of, 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 of power, but it's, it's false power, right? We've, we've got, we've got three women, we had a defense, foreign affairs and the finance minister, and there's not a cognitive, there's not a cognitive vision between the three of them. It's just the, basically the measurement of their, of their strength in that role is how good are your literacy skills to read the statements that are being made for you. I don't think that Harper took it that far. So that's just my one. I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that. But I think you're where we absolutely are aligned is the question of if we can't find strength in those roles, is the is the role of foreign affairs really strong? And I'll I'll bring it back to what I said last week, which is do we as Canadians, aside from the, the leadership, but do we as Canadians understand the difference between a foreign affairs portfolio? and foreign trade? Have yeah. we intermixed and, and, and confused those two things as being like the measure of our external relations is, is, our, is our trade deals? And if that's the case, then we're gonna continue to have you know, lackluster pieces. But you know, at some point, we're going to reach a m- moment where you know, defense is going to be needed. We're going to have a, 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 a national challenge of, of, some, of some gravitas and we're going to find that this lack of depth in the bench is really going to be a problem. Which that's what the conservatives are going through right now as well, because they're trying to figure out where their leadership goes. But I agree that there's a lack of depth on all sides of the uh, the, part, the aisle right now. Agreed. And, and this is why I talk about election readiness as much as I do, because yeah. one of the things that drives me crazy is that I don't want to be in federal politics because I'm a woman and I'm going to look great on a billboard and I'm going to prove that, you know, conservatives have, you know, have diversity in their bench. I want to be on a billboard because I went to Johns Hopkins I did a credential at Harvard. I, I understand, you know, climate-based human migration. These are the things that I bring as an expertise. This is the problem with parity. This is the problem with gender parity in politics is that we're so busy looking at, do we have one of these? Do we have one of these? Do we have one of these? Do we have someone from here? Do we have someone from here? That then we get in and it's like, hey, hey, is anybody a lawyer? We need an, we need an attorney general. Is anybody a and that becomes a really big problem for the party is because why, like, and I say this about the conservatives now, conservatives are going through a lot of upheaval. Look at your party, look at the momentum of Canada and say, do we have people from tech? Do we have people who come from STEM? Do we have people who come from law? Do we have people who come from, like, let's get in the, the economic drivers that we need to be able to flesh out this party and a vision forward. And then we could be the party of economics and stop being the, the party of, hey, we're not Derek Sloan. I just think you can change the narrative that way. But now I'm really digressing on you. No, Sorry. but I want to digress one last time before we do move, uh, go back into foreign affairs here for a second, is you and I both know politics is not where the money's made. Anyone who's worth a damn, who sure. has a good a good uh, resume, who wants to potentially do something good for the world or their country, does not get into politics. So when you're saying we need a good person who knows medical issues to be that health minister, they're going, I'm making more money in the private sector right now. So pfft, yourself, if there's someone but if who- you become a, If you ahead. become a country of vision- if you could become a country of vision where you're not defined by how well you can apologize, when you become a country of vision, you would, you're surprised when you, how you can inspire people to be voices of service. There are people who want to be in service. There's still people that, 
you know, and they, they'd enlist in the military. Like there's people that want to be of service. There's still national pride here. And I think we always underestimate where national pride can take people who are very smart thinkers. I I'm will, not giving up. Maybe I'm the Peter Pan of this, but no, I, I, I would agree. I just, it seems like the pool is shrinking very fast for a lot of the parties to even look at those uh, because I think into anyway, that's, that's for another conversation because, for another day. Because we're losing who we are. Yeah. Um, let's, I'm going to ask you a poignant question. Who's been the best foreign affairs minister you've seen in your lifetime? Oh God, I don't know. What, who is yours? Bill Graham. Really? Under Paul Martin. I think Bill, so. Bill Graham had the gravitas and he had the knowledge to go talk to people. And Paul Martin allowed him to do that. I think Paul Martin was the last good prime minister we've had, to be honest. I know that's showing okay. my colors, but hot take. Hot take. Uh, I was a crutch hand. That but... sounds like a good <laughs> that sounds like a Twitter poll to me. There Just you saying. go. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Jen and Chris need to know your opinion. Twitter poll. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Jen um, and Chris care. Yeah, exactly. Um, where does Jolie go? So we, we've talked about how she's gonna be a mouthpiece. Um, is she gonna be the sort of the face of Canada across the world? Or is Justin Trudeau just going to bring nope. her along basically like luggage? I think you're going to see her very little. I think yes. when it really matters, you're going to see the prime minister himself. I think, um, you know, I was just watching the news footage of, of her with the her U.S. counterpart. That it was a masterclass in awkwardness. I've had first dates that were less awkward and I pride myself on being awkward. And I mean, I think you're going to just see her you know, stand for photos. And I think it's going to be the same as it is for all the other portfolios. You're there to cut the grocery store ribbons. Don't make it complicated. And when it really matters, the prime minister will be there. So I don't, I don't think you're going to see anything. I think you're just, she's, I don't think you're going to see anything. So we have seen uh, sort of the prime minister start his travel itinerary before parliament resumes. Well, it resumed yesterday if as of this airing, but he has gone to Glasgow. He's gone to, if I'm not mistaken, Netherlands, and he's gone to the USA. And, and he was he, in Rome. And right? Rome, yes. Each one of those trips, he's bringing... I'm Carbon. Gonna get, I, I'm going to get hate mail from this, and I know I'm going to get hate mail from this. He brings <laughs> his three, his lucky three women behind him. He brings Mary Ning. He brings Melanie Jolie. He brings uh, Christian Freeland. Christian Freeland. Because these are the three, like, he looks like he's um, Bosley off of the Charlie's Angels. <laughs> like, Kate Telford and Jerry Butts are Charlie, and they're saying what they need to say to go do things. And Bosley's just going around fumbling over himself to try and make this work. We saw him go to Glasgow, and we'll start there because that is the most important one that we want to talk about, is COP26. The climate, the sorry, the uh, caucus of parties. I forget the name of it. I'm like blanking right now. Something of parties uh, conference, the United Nations Declaration for Environmental Impact. As Jen just right. openly said, all these people seem to go, and all these people seem to not realize that it takes carbon to go to these places, like airplanes and. I don't know, oil and gas and cars and electricity that run. So um, before we get into the uh, sort of the end of what happened, are, you and I are doing this via Zoom. <laughs> Could this yes. not have been a big, massive fucking, pardon my French, a massive Zoom conference? Is there a is there a moment in time where party where heads of governments have to say, you know what, we're all living in a new world now. We don't need to meet in a massive, giant ass conference on climate change that is going to cost more than it's actually going to save. Well, I think you know, true blue diplomats will always argue that you have to be in place, you have to be together to have true diplomacy. Uh, I find that argument weak at best. Um, I, you know, I, I, 
I, I don't want to jump on the bandwagon of like, well, this wasn't the most environmentally responsible way to have I a will. conference because I, I will. yeah, you can, I will. you can, you please join the, <laughs> the locomotion of that idea. Go ahead. For me, the real thing about COP26 was how much it was a barometer of how smart Canadians are right? Because if you're a really smart, discerning Canadian and you can know how to read the news and you've been following, you're like, what happened? And if you're not that bright, but you're kind of worried about the environment, you've never been more proud of your prime minister. And, and so I'll just, I'll just give like some examples of like, you know, big declarations. Cause you know, this is the PR Olympics for Trudeau. He saves up for this, gets the good haircut. Like he's, this is where he gets to be all bravado and no substance, which let's be mindful that the, the rest of the world has figured that out, right? That Justin Trudeau is the, now the quintessential definition of all hat, no cattle. Like he just is like, talks, 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 sounds so pretty. And it really means nothing, right? It just shaves years off Angela Merkel's life. So, you know, he makes this big declaration that Canada will, 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 uh, will roll back coal, right? We're going to roll back coal. But the truth is we've been rolling back coal for forever. We're already doing that. It would be like, if I was like, Hey, I'm on this podcast and I think I'm going to get into podcasting. You'd be like, Jen, you're already here. You're already here. You and already so, have you know, your own podcast. Don't you? <laughs> like, it seems weird exactly. that you're like, announcing something you've already done. <laughs> it's exactly. Um, I think, you know, if you're paying attention, right. If you like, if you're literate and you're paying attention, you're like, well, we've been rolling back coal. Someone's going to ask him, yeah, you've been rolling back coal, but your greenhouse gas emissions keep rising. So maybe coal isn't enough. Right. And yet nobody asks him those questions because he's figured out that, you know, there's no point. It's just going to be a filibuster answer. So he gets to have this big grandstanding piece on coal. But the reality is, is like, you know, we've been, we've been really managing, you know, a future with other tech or other, other energy sources without coal for a long time now. So it's just an announcement that really means nothing. It's like during an election season, when they re-announce financing for something they announced financing for two years ago, but it's an election period. So people are paying attention. The, the other piece, um, the other good one that I really enjoyed was around reforestation right? Like they're like, you know, deforestation is an issue. We believe in reforestation, you know, we're going to offset, you know, any, anything that we do to, you know, to our forests. You guys, we've been doing that for forever already. It's the law that if you cut down a tree, you have to replace it with another tree. This is not some magical promise that we're making. This is just the way we do it here. The bigger, like that's the like, reforestation is not for you. Don't, don't take that bait. That's for Brazil. Who's cutting down the rainforest and doing dick all to fix it. Like, it just felt so like every time you went to talk, I was like, what is happening? And of course, you know, you know, enter my ire around the conservative party or even the NDP or even the greens being so dysfunctional within the side of their party right now that they can't just issue like a daily press release that was like, here is all the garbage you were asked to buy. And here's the truth of the matter on it. Like, that's what really frustrates me the most is that we have a 75,000 party system. Okay. I'm being facetious, but we have a five party system, which made it you know, beholden to, I think on the other four parties to say, we did not form government, but we know we have a mandate to hold this government to account. Here's what we're doing. And instead we're just dealing with, you know, infighting in one party, a lack of leadership in the other and whatever Jagmeet Singh is doing day to day, which just still around. Like I I haven't seen him in a while. So, well, he just, even, even yesterday with his tweet around, like, I know you're upset about Kyle Rittenhouse and it's like, Hey buddy, like time in place. Your, time in place. your own writing is rationing gas. Like just cool it on the wokeness today because we have real problems to solve on this one particular economic <laughs> issue. And when it comes to cop on this one particular climate issue. So if you're paying attention, you just heard everything that he said and you're like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? How dumb do you think Canadians are? And the answer clearly coming out of cop 26 is pretty dumb. However, there were some shining stars that I think deserve some attention here. So before you do that, I want to jump in here for two seconds because you talk about deforestation, not one media outlet for Canadian media asked the follow-up question. So where's that billion trees that you promised to plant that you in the 2019 plant election? 
So, yeah, I mean, it's about this time that I remind you that I used to work in the climate space and that drives me absolutely mental. I don't understand. Yeah. Nobody's asking the tough questions. He's figured this out. So it just becomes its own thing. But the bigger thing that he said that I think deserves some real octane here is when he said, I would like to see a, gro- a global price on carbon. And to that, I say, let's go. Because what's going to happen is you try to fight for a global price on carbon, you're going to have a rioting across the world, especially like think of France, honest to God, like think of some of your other European ally, they're just going to be like rioting in the streets about like, this is ridiculous. This is not a way to solve our carbon emissions problem. Putting a price on it doesn't change the behavior if the behaviors can't change to an alternative resource, which I think would embolden Canadians then to ask, why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? So I actually think that this carbon pricing thing, like, you know, I just, my point is, is that it lacks innovation because Canada is a bright, we're bright people. We're bright, except for our leader, we are bright people. We're bright people and we love innovation. And why couldn't we go and say, the reality is, is carbon capture at the source, right? The, you know, d- dealing again with, you know, restricting foreign, fu- foreign funding um, for, for projects that have high emissions, right? People trying to do business here because they can't do business where they are because they're trying to lower their carbon emissions. Natural infrastructure. You've heard me talk about natural infrastructure. We need this made in Canada solution right? We need to be able to go to these conferences and say, hey, buddy, like one size isn't going to fit all, but this is what can- Canada is going to do. We're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And this is how we're going to meet the target. This is what we're going to do to try to help this 1.5 degree, you know, you know, stop, hold, like emergency break that we're trying not to hit. Um, you know, it would be so smart of him to go and say, you know, what I'm advocating for is we have a lot of environmental groups that are in the space, but we also have environmental groups that are doing nefarious activities. We're going to launch a national whistleblower law, or we're going to give funding to the UN to have a national, to have an international whistleblower law. So organizations that do nefarious things with public dollars in the spirit of, of, of environmentalism, but in the reality of profiteering, you know, they get shivved in the neck or whatever. Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Oh, now let's get back to the episode. So the one thing I was surprised that didn't come out of COP26, and this was the one that I was actually looking for because it's coming up to the UN, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in, fe- in December, if not early 2020. But uh, the Rome statue, uh, Article 13 or Amendment 13, Amendment 6, Amendment 13, one or the other. I apologize. I'm getting my numbers mixed up because my mind is not the best right now. Um, basically, the Rome statues outlines, basically, you can get sued for murdering somebody, all this fun stuff. And they want to add one that says, hey, if you do something wrong in the climate, Governments have the right to sue you. Businesses are now being held responsible for what they do and where they go. So the Rome statute, which is going to be put forward, if I think the amendment is getting put forward in, like I said, I think it's going to be up for debate in December. They're going to start debating it later in 2022. I will get more information for that in the next episode. I promise I will come back with better information than just talking off the top of my head right now. But we need that. We need someone to come up with an amendment and say, hey, this is what we're going to do, guys. Businesses, governments are going to be held account to what is being done. If you do not clean up after an oil spill, if you do not clean up after a derelict of the environment, we can sue you and basically ruin you. Because if we're just going to tax the average person with a carbon tax, it's not going to go far. We're still going to use gas. We're still going to travel. We're still going to make carbon emissions. How do we fix the things that need to be fixed? And how do we hold people responsible for the things that need to be done? Listen, I think that there's a case to be made 
for things like that BP oil spill in the Gulf. Like that was so reckless that went on for forever. You know, the, the, every, the, there's no really strong emergency management program for those types of things spills in the Arctic. Like we know that these things are awful and we need to hold people account for account. What the problem is with the Rome statute is it allows people to say anything nefarious that you do, I can hold you to account. And that will create such market instability that we will grind the economy to a halt. You have to start somewhere there, though, don't you? Oh, my God. You have to start somewhere. You're going to start by destroying the economy. I think, see, this is where we, this is the this is the beef that I have, is that we go down these legal statutes when we have so many other problems to solve. Like, coming out of COP26, we really realized that the, the main issue that we're going to have in Canada isn't, can we come up with a made in Canada climate solution? It isn't, why do we have such a grandstanding prime minister who says things that mean nothing? What we really realized is that it really did highlight once again, that we really still do have a problem in confederation in this, in this, in this, in this country. And as someone from Alberta, um, and as someone from the West, and as someone, you know, from an oil producing part of this country, you know, I think that the real takeaway was not for the world in this 1.5 degrees. The real takeaway was for Alberta and Saskatchewan out of COP26. I mean, we watched, you know, and of course it comes like right after the, you know, another shuffle that gave us a very dynamic environment minister who, who, you know, coupled with Jonathan Wilkinson is going to do some, uh, it's going to just be a wild ride, I think. And they have carte blanche. You talk about two people that have carte blanche. They have carte blanche from the, from the prime minister's office. But one of the things that I was talking about with my father, which if people listen to my podcast, conservative like me, which with Jennifer Sanford, you'll know that my father often joins me. He made a compelling point as I was putting together my prep notes for today. He said, you know, this is a moment of dynamic decision-making for Alberta and Saskatchewan coming out of COP26. You know, what would it look like in that dynamic moment if they said, okay, we're going to pull our oil out of the ground. We're going to privately invest in carbon capture technologies at the source because we no longer trust the government to be in it, to win it on real climate change. They just want to find the money. Um, and we're going to put all that on tankers, send it down to the St. Lawrence. And as we watch, you know, other Saudi tankers come in, our Alberta tankers will come out. Um, you know, let's close line five. Let's close line five. If everybody wants it gone, the prime minister wants it gone, you know, the, the governor of, of Michigan wants it gone. Let's close line five. Let's freeze Michigan. Let's freeze Sarnia. Let's freeze Southwest Ontario. And they can find a solution from themselves. You know, Trans Canada pipeline um, with the, with the, you know, the, I don't even know what to call it in BC by the, you know, its efforts to try to fall off the map. Um, it's, you know, why don't we just close the trans Canada pipeline and say like, this is such a, this is such a problem because you have to remember that at the same time that this trans Canada pipeline is undergoing incredible efforts to be built. CP was successful in having a rail line now built that fully links Canada to the United States to Mexico start buying some rail cars, right? Rachel Notley started the effort. Let's continue. Let's just get our stuff and just say, if this is if this is the rhetoric that this that this federal government wants, this reforestation with no trees, it's already the law, this commitment to a global like all of this noise at a COP26. Now is the moment for dynamic decision making out of Alberta and Saskatchewan to say, we're going to take our commodity, we're going to take our goods, and we're going to find markets that want them. And we're going to be ambassadors of trade. And we're simply going to say to the government, the federal government, you wanted this, you got it. Now you can report to the world how low our carbon emissions really are and how environmentally great we are while we have done the work to invest in the tech and get it out and trade it and, and make ourselves very wealthy. The issue is we have two premiers and a prime minister who are basically playing the who has the larger penis right now. Yeah, they sure are. And here's the tip. None of them do. I agree wholeheartedly on that one. I have I have come to the realization over the last month of paying attention to the news that Scott Mojas and Kenny and uh, Justin Trudeau all need to get into a room somewhere and just have a massive orgy because it's just becoming a point where uh, news article after news article is just them trying to fuck each other over. Pardon my French, whoever's listening to this. But it also, but it also becomes 
but it also becomes about asking better questions about what really are our environmental values in this country. And that can only be scaled by civic society. That can only be scaled by people like you and people like me asking the questions of, don't even tell me that Quebec wants to have a conversation about carbon emission footprints and that's how they fit in equalization. Just answer me this one question. Why does every project have to have an environmental review unless that project is in Quebec? Right? Tell me what the environmental impact is of mining the minerals to make EV batteries. Why can nobody answer these questions for me? Right? Sarnia looks like a goddamn wasteland. Don't tell me that we're doing the right environmental things. Look, we're, oh, we're lowering our footprint because we're moving to, while well, we're, where we're pulling lithium and, and, and whatever else it takes to make a battery out of, out of the ground. I think it's also about as a civil society of a civic society, asking more comprehensive questions about what really are our environmental values. Because when one company is subject to one and another company in another part of the world is subject to not nearly the same level of, of, of scrutiny and, and prudence, we have real problems in this country. And what I'm saying is that these problems will continue to persist so long as we have the asymmetrical application of confederation. And now is absolutely the time for, and, and I will say this now, I love that this is across all borders and we're only in Alberta, but I will say that if Jason Kenny woke up in the morning and said, these are the questions I want to ask, this is the shit I want to talk about. I don't care anymore about daylight savings time. I don't care anymore about $10 a day childcare because that deal is done. I want to talk about these things. I want to talk about what we're going to do as economic drivers. I will guarantee you that this leadership bullshit goes away. Oh, it doesn't. But anyway, that's that's for another show. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say about COP26. It was the goal was one point. I, I love the way the UN put it. Right. The goal was we had to we had to address the the remediation of this one point five uh, degree you know, emergency break, you know, so, China's so, going to double down on coal. Russia doesn't give a shit. Brazil's going to continue to burn down the forest and Saudi oil will tank anywhere you want to go. Um, so dirty oil will take you anywhere you want to go. And the UN is like, I don't think we achieved it. So basically what we all did is we expelled all of that carbon to go and then expel more carbon with all of the things that we said that now we can't do. And I think it's a really dismal day for the planet that we live on. So I, I, I have the wording of the pack, part of the pack, because I, I found it quite and I, I try to pride myself on being a smart person. I try to pride myself on being someone who kind of knows what things are happening and why things are happening and where things are heading. I read part of this pack and I was confused as hell. And I could not understand what the hell they were trying to get at. I'm going to read it for you. Reaffirms the Paris Agreement temperature goal of holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two, uh, two, Celsius, two degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. Okay, yeah. the average person sleep tight, everybody does not know what the hell that means. Like Jen just said, Explain to me in terms a two-year-old toddler could understand how the hell that is going to affect me. Because I don't think Justin Trudeau could do it. I don't think Stephen Gabo could do it. I don't think Aaron O'Toole could do it. I don't think any of the Boris Johnson sure as hell couldn't do it. But we have 197 you, countries signed have... on to something I don't yeah, know what the you... hell we've signed on to. Yeah, but when you have 197 countries trying to work together on language, it's going to sound like that because you're like, how many words can we use to say nothing? Exactly. So, I mean, this is what you get. This is what you get. So this goes back to my original statement of we we spent all this carbon, sh we spewed all this carbon into the world for what? A pack that no one can explain to me what the hell it means. Uh, yes. Sleep tight, everybody. And uh, don't even get me started on the climate emergency that was declared in Calgary, because I could tell you right now, oh. I, have some, I have some things about that because right, like you declare a climate emergency, then you allow a freaking airline to set up shop. Air, airplanes are electric now. So I can imagine those are all going to be like carbon zero by 2030 as they plan or 2050 as they plan. We have this new arena deal. That's going to be carbon neutral by 2050 bull. And I understand. Yeah, it's but you're, you're also you're 
you're also missing the biggest part of that, which is our illustrious city council votes for this climate emergency, right? And they're all like, you know, look at me, I did it. You guys, we did it. And the five minutes later, then the city services comes back and says, we don't even know what this is going to cost. We don't have any money for this. Yeah. We don't have any sense of like you've declared it, but we don't really know what you've declared. There's no money provisioned for this. So it's just like, now I'm going to make proclamations on behalf of the city every day, just because if, if you don't have to even look at the costing and I feel like the next thing that's going to happen is someone's going to say, what's this going to cost? And the answer will be, how can you, how can you put a price on the environment? And I'm like, oh, we can, and we must, because we're bankrupt. We have no money. We have well, no money. I, right? I, I, I am looking forward to this budget because I, I will look at it and go, everything that you've approved, tell me how that's going to uh, help our climate declaration. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I don't, <clears throat> Chris, you're going to have to get more vocal to have some roundups. Oh, have some roundups. Oh, I'm looking forward to, uh, for anyone who has been paying attention over the last few days um, or last day and a half or day, because it was just announced yesterday, please tune on, Jan tune in on January 2nd, where we have a massive announcement for the cross border interview podcast, where we are looking forward to 2020 in February of 2022. Um, so please, 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 please tune in on January 2nd, 2022, uh, January 2nd, 2022. You can't keep us hanging for this well, long. Well, I'm still, I'm still, I'll, I'll tell you after the recording's done, but we will. Oh, we, I get to know. Okay. You get to know and a few other people get to know, but we are looking forward to this because we are going to, we are going to start holding people to account. And in 2022, the cross border interview podcast is going to do just that. If the, if the national media, if the local media won't do it, someone's going to do it and it's going to be me. So please tune in on January 2nd, 2022, when we announce some more details about that. But speaking about holding things to account, hey, three amigos met in Washington this week, and that was a gong show and a half, if you ask me. Mr. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Joe Biden, President of the United States, and the Mexican President, I don't remember his name right now because I've been angry for the last two minutes about carbon. Oh, so um, met in Washington for what I can imagine was the dullest meetings I can imagine anyone would have had to sit in because each one of them came with their own agenda and the declaration, the transcript that Prime Minister Trudeau released after the meetings didn't really come away with much on all ends. <sighs> Jen, what was your thoughts on the, the North American Leaders Summit as it's actually called? Well, I'm very happy that they didn't have to do that handshake. I'm sad that we had to have a global pandemic in order to get rid of that handshake, but I'm very happy that that's gone. That <laughs> For those who are listening Chris, to this via the Chris audio Chris is doing version. the visual. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Chris is doing the visual. Tune into YouTube for a few minutes and you'll see that very awkward <laughs> visual. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough, it is a tough summit to have because the needs between President Biden and President Obrador are so different than the needs of President Biden and Prime Minister Socks and Selfies. So it's so difficult to try to have a summit of the three and, and sort of list a sense of priorities. Um, one of the things I did take away from myself is that when Biden says out loud that the relationship with Canada is the easiest relationship that he has. Somebody needs to tell the prime minister that that is not a compliment. It is not what Joe Biden should be saying is it's one of the most productive. It's one of the most uh, intensive. It's one of the most important. Um, it's easy because we're on ignore, right? It's easy because in a post pandemic environment, the United States has really looked at how do we get really nationalistic with how do we bring in our supply chain how do we really take Trump era policies that you didn't like the wrapper of like, you know, buy American and make them more like a, like a, you know, buy American strategy that we, we do like, right. So much of this infrastructure bill is about really creating a, a manufacturing base as a, as a mechanism to support, a, you know, a, a middle-class revival for, for the United States. Nothing wrong with that, but I just think we have to realize that that directly impacts the well-being of Canada. And when I hear Joe Biden say like, oh yeah, Justin is so easy. I just think then he's not doing his job. 
he's not doing his job because we have things that we need. And this is the major, this is the major, this is our major player. Like we, we are, we are tied to the United States in, in every possible facet of our, of our economic and social and military and protective well-being. Um, I think the big thing that I, that came out of the summit for me, of course, is, is the, how much trouble we're in with electric vehicles. Um, and I think that Canadians don't really understand what the United States has decided. And if you'll give me a few minutes, Chris, I'd actually just like to spell it out for your listeners. Go for it. That's why you're on the show to spell things out for me and my listeners. So the, here, I, I'll go like, get a coffee. Of, I'm absolutely. joking. I'm not. Enjoy your sandwich. Enjoy your sandwich. Welcome to the Cross Border Podcast. I'm your new host, Jennifer Sanford. Um, so basically what, what Americans have, the American, the U.S. government has tried to do here is to say that if you buy an electronic vehicle, if you drive, if you, if you choose to purchase an EV, um, we're going to make it very in- incentivized for you to do so. So there's two tax credits available. Tax credit number one is to buy the vehicle. And then tax credit number two is just for having the battery, right? There's a separate tax credit for the battery. The caveat is, is that in order to get this rebate, which is $12,500, which is quite a substantial rebate on a vehicle, enough so that you'd be looking at it, right? You'd be like, oh, yeah. oh get some good money back here. The caveat to this is that in order to get this money, the vehicle has to be fully constructed in the United States by union employees, right? So this is where we're trying to have a a green revolution in the United States, but we're also trying to support um, the manufacturing sector and unionized workers and all of those people that love to vote Democrat, right? AKA Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) car town, the, the big three. So the problem with that is that in Southwestern Ontario, we predominantly have built those North American cars, right? Ford, Chrysler, we've been building those cars um, in in Southwestern Ontario. So now for Joe Biden to say, uh, no, thank you. We don't need you in the supply chain. And in fact, we're making the incentive subject to, you know, was this car manufactured in the United States and and, and was it done with US um, unionized workers? So that's like, thanks, but no thanks. And what we have to remember is that half a billion dollars was just spent of our taxpayer money for the Ford government and Jerry Diaz to go to Ford and say, build your cars here. We will pay you to build these cars so that we can, you can pay our workers so that the manufacturing can remain. And this, I think, makes Jerry Diaz, if there's one person that I would love to interview in my life, it's Jerry Diaz, because he is both the president and the CEO of Fantasyland now, because he's all about representing workers. Like I'm watching what he's doing with WestJet. And I'm like, aren't you paying attention? Onyx is privately own, privately owns WestJet. They're going to be, everything's, you're going to go to the airport and never see a person. Everything's going to be automated. (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? You're going to protect all these union jobs. These jobs are gone. And I think the, the, this, 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 um, initiative, this buy American initiative, um, is, is, is going to be the nail in the coffin for these manufacturing jobs here in Canada. And I don't think that Justin Trudeau stood on his laurels hard enough to say, we have had decades of a working relationship. Don't you understand what you are doing, right? You can hawk a loogie in Windsor and hit Detroit. Like this is the same thing. Let's work together. But the more compelling thought to that is that if we really had a prime minister of innovation, he would have first stepped back and said, wait a minute, I don't like this policy, but I cannot deny that this is good. This is good political policy. It is. It is good political policy. Why didn't he step back and say, we're going to use those same manufacturing chains here in Canada and we're going to build cars and we're going to offer Canadians the same incentive to have a fully, to have an EV vehicle here in Canada. You know, yes, there are far fewer of us than there are in the U.S., but there's still, I think, a lot of people that would look at an EV vehicle if we had the same rebate program in place, built in Sarnia or, or built in Southwest Ontario by our people. Um, we'll, we'll offer. I mean, I think our rebate would have to be more because we pay workers more. The cost of living, the cost of materials would be more. But let's say we offered seventeen thousand five hundred dollars off a vehicle. 
we, I think, could manufacture a lot of vehicles for just our own Canadians. And then we've moved our supply chain in. And then after that, you look for trading partners in other places. So I think there's just like this little bit of a, like a rallying call and this, we are getting screwed on this EV deal with America, but I don't blame America. It's a good deal. It's a good, it's a good idea. But the question is now, do we have a prime minister that's smart enough to say, we should do that here too. We should do that here too. This will be a great push to get Canadian, to get Canadians into EV, you know, contract out some mechanism to actually allow people in rural environments to be on the, on a grid. Cause of course I'm from rural Alberta and I'm like, how are you going to get Grand Prairie on a grid? Like where on the Coquihalla are you going to get people on a grid? But right. I'm not beyond the tech. I am going to say two things to you. Why aren't we doing it here? Because we have a government who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I'd like to note that I'm the host of conservative like me and you are way more conservative than I am. And I'm I, taking a few and here's the thing. I ran at the for prime Trudeau. minister, but you are taking. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't, dis- I don't disagree with that, but at the same time, like sometimes when you see a good policy, you're like, Oh God, we should do that here. Yeah. But we could have a great policy, slap them across the face. And yet again, we wouldn't be able to know what, what to do with it. And this is basically ending my political career ever, running ever again, oh, unless, no, it's- it's, unless it's for municipal politics. But um, I will say this. Joe Biden is doing the right thing for his country. I don't think anyone can disagree with that statement. I think he- Which let's just be reminded was a lot of the same policy as Trump had, I just want to say. Exactly. It's just Joe Biden has gotten it into his malarkey he's way. Uncle Joe. Exactly. He's yeah, Uncle he's Joe. Just, and We just changed the wrapper. It's the same candy. Uncle Joe and Aunt Kamala, who doesn't really appear that often, but she's there. She's just not she's there. there. <laughs> she's there. She met with Trudeau, she's so there. she's there. She's just not there in the grand <laughs> scheme of things. Joe Biden has realized that Canada is a non-player. I think most of the countries have realized that Canada is a non-player anymore. And I think- Yes, because he uh, has listening skills. It's because he has listening skills, right? He It's continued reputation degradation, right? We say things we don't mean. We produce hot air and that's our reputation. Like we have that reputation because we've earned that reputation. Exactly. Just, sorry, jump in. I just wanted to say that. No, and I agree. Um, the, the running joke in my household is whenever the pre- the president of the United States meets with the country, they usually start the conversation off with, oh, insert country name here is America's XX, which yeah. for Australia this time it was Australia is the most important relationship America has. So you cannot, because he said that when they were announcing the uh, UK, Australia, Can- uh, America, nuclear submarine. Not Canada. Not That's Canada right. during the middle of an election. And Australia has become their most important uh, partner now. And during Obama with Harper, during Bush with Martin, during Clinton with uh, Kretchen, it was the most important partnership because you had a great working relationship. I'm not sure if this is the Trudeau factor or I'm not sure if this is the Trump factor coming into play here. And that's where I want to look into a little bit more before I start spewing too much is did Trudeau suck up to Trump too much where people now sort of look at them both and go, hmm, are you the same? You you played to Trump's hand a lot with the NAFTA re- renegotiations, which really got us nothing. If you were looking to get something, that was the perfect time to get it. That's my that's my two cents on that subject. I just I think Justin Trudeau has a lot of work to do, and I don't think he's up for it because I think he's 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 looking at his hotel bill right now, and he's looking at when his checkout time is. Uh. <laughs> Oh no, I think the delusion has taken full force. I think he's just, well, you saw this last year when he's like, I'm the Dean of the G7. And we were all just like, oh, (sighs) I feel your embarrassment that you should feel on your behalf. But you also have to look at like, at some point, a spade is a spade, right? Like Joe Biden has been in the political space. Really? You're going to use that word? (laughs) But Joe Biden has been in the political space for 400 years, right? Half of his life. 
And you've got, you know, Emmanuel Macron, who has a really sort of disciplined mind. You've got Angela Merkel, who I think is the preeminent expert in diplomacy. You've got Mario in Italy, who is one of the most important economists of his time. And then you've got Justin. Like at some point, it just becomes what you are. Right. And I like, I don't, my goal here is not to overtly pick on him, but when he says in an election, I don't really know what monetary policy is. You're like, yeah. And that's starting to be the problem. That's where, that's why we're at where we're at. So I also think when you put him into a room of people, he's like the guy who has the party jokes. I just don't, I get at some point it just becomes who you are. And, you know, I'm sure that you know, there's, I'm sure that there's a will on the part of the United States, and I would include Mexico too, to say, you know, here are the, here are the things we want to talk about here, here are the things that are important. And we just don't have any depth in the bench for anyone to have those kind of conversations. I mean, you want to talk about Latin American politics here in a minute, you know, we couldn't even get in a, like, we couldn't even get a representative in a, in a position of leadership before the last summit of the Americas. Like we didn't even send a representative down because we just couldn't get ourselves mobilized probably because we couldn't find anybody to participate in that. And I think that that's the importance of representing the difference between your size as a country and your size as a position of influence. And I'm, I think those two things are not mutually exclu inclusive, exclusive. Yeah. We are always releasing new episodes and from time to time, new specials of the Cross Border Interview podcast. Be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are getting your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. But also, be sure to head over to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and give us a follow. We have behind the scene looks at upcoming guests, upcoming episodes, and some special social media only content. Subscribe to the show now. And now, let's get back to our episode. I'm going to ask a question. It's going to be a pointed question. Is there any depth of leadership in Canada right now, even on the premier's level? Yes. Who? Uh, I think I like Saskatchewan's leadership. Like I think Scott. that there's real... I, I think that there's real depth in that bench. I do. Um, and I think he's covered Kenny's ass for a long time. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of, of, of Horgan at all in BC and especially having been a resident of BC for, for as long as I was. Um, but you know, he, he does have, you know, some understanding of, of how that province needs to run and, and how, how, you know, how its struggles impact its success. And, and, um, you know, I, I do think that there are our leaders, but I do think that people are being kept out of politics uh, because we lack vision. We lack vision. I mean, I've, I've often said like, you know, even in the conservative infrastructure, like somewhere there's James Moore, somewhere there's, you know, Andrew McC McConnell, like there's, there's depth in the bench. They're just not in politics because, you know, first of all, a lot of them are being told you're an, you're a white male. So stay out, which I think is terrible. Right. Um, I think if you have an educated mind and something to contribute, you should be in the political process. Um, but I, I think that there there are intellectual people. I mean, even just on this podcast, you know, the two of us know what's up. Why are we being held out? Thanks. I know. Right. I know. Right. It's like a compliment halfway through this godforsaken podcast. Halfway through. We're an hour in, girl. We're an hour in. I love how you send me a meeting invite and you're like, we're going to talk for an hour. And I'm like, bullshit, we are. <laughs> um, okay. So the la the next topic I wanted to talk about, and this is not going to be that long. It's just, I need to get this off my chest because this has been bothering me because there's been literally no media coverage of it in Canada. And I'm hoping to change that. I'm hoping people smarten up and realize there's something going on and we need to do something about it. Melanie Jolie, call me up. We'll have a discussion about it or head over to Africa and figure out what the hell's going on. I know Jenna, if, for those who are listening on the podcast or the audio version of the podcast, nah, Jenna is shaking her head. Here. No, what are you talking about, Chris? You're up shit creek no with a paddle way. if you think that's going to happen. 
<laughs> Africa. And I people mentioned... who are do people who are watching, the people who are not listening but watching are watching me consume the giant, the largest <laughs> chocolate milk I've ever consumed ever. And like all of that sugar has totally hit my system now. So yeah, let's talk about Africa. Let's talk about Africa for two seconds here. Because um if you have not been paying attention, which like I said, the media has not been, so most people probably wouldn't be. I, I've been looking at Africa probably for the last, I would say five to 10 years because it is an important area of the world where there's a lot of resources and a lot of minerals and a lot of uh, potential growth for diplomacy, but also world, what's the word I wanna use here? Sway. China has been making a play for Africa Africa for some time now. They are in there. They are giving countries money. They are hiring their workers to build up the country. And if that doesn't scare somebody, I don't know what should. Right now, the United States uh, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, is over in Africa on a three-day tour. If I'm not mistaken, his last day is Tuesday to shore up support for America's ideals in Africa. China has been playing this game since, well, the China, the, the current government, I'm going to, I always pronounce their government party's name wrong, the people's, the, uh, what, oh my God. Jen, use your, use your like beautiful mind here. And what is the government's party in uh, China? Uh, it's the People's Republic of China. Okay, I was going to say People's Party of China, but it's the People's Republic of China. Everybody says People's Party because of Maxim Bernier. <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about him this episode. <laughs> so the People's Party, uh, the People's the, the People's Republic of China, uh, began uh, making their play for Africa when uh, they formed government because they needed to be recognized as a truly. Uh, tr a true government. And to do that, they started throwing money at Africa. They started promising them uh, jobs. They promised them goods. And in return, what they would get is recognized as a uh, true legitimate power, but also access to their minerals. And we talked about this a little bit last podcast, last episode of the Crossing All Borders, which is China has been making a play for natural resources for a long time, and it seems like the world is turning a blind eye. We want to start building America back or build back better, as every godforsaken English country has been saying for the last, well, eight months since Joe Biden was elected. You need to start getting resources. And where are the resources? In countries that are not China. They are in Africa. So you need to start playing there. And if you aren't, you're going to lose out an opportunity and let China become a superpower. I'm going to turn it over to um, Jen here for a second. I, I know I sprung this topic on her a little bit last minute. So I'm assuming she probably ran around and tried to learn as much as she possibly could. But do you know much about what's happening in Africa right now, or am I just up creek without a paddle and thinking too much into this? Well, I think if people were listening to our podcast from last month, where we talked about China's interest in Afghanistan, Afghanistan yep. where, you know, for years they've now, they had two decades of occupation. Afghanistan has been continually destabilized by people coming in with their own interests, um, especially Russia, you know, being on both sides of the arm arms, you know, you know, equipping them with arms. Let me just say it diplomatically, um, you know, for a country like China to come in and say, okay, we were smart enough to buy the port in Pakistan, which we know you're in bed with. Like, we're not going to pretend that you in Pakistan are like have some sort of, we know that you guys have helped each other for forever. We're going to say that we don't give a shit what you do to each other. We don't care what your rights are for women. We don't, we don't want to govern any part of your moral compass. We don't care. All we want is the minerals that you have, and we will make you very wealthy. And I don't know why anybody in the town Taliban wouldn't do that deal, mm -hmm. right? Because finally you have what you want. You're going to bring prosperity. If you want to continue to be corrupt, whatever, but you, you now have the ability to have an economic driver and to have a, a some legitimacy, like America's going to leave you alone because they don't want to get into a dispute with China. Like China's the new superpower, right? China's the new US. So 
smart deal for Afghanistan. And what we're just seeing there is this being replicated in Africa. I mean, this is largely like historically how this is done with countries who have had iterations of occupation and then who have waited for civil unrest. And then, you know, Russia comes in in civil unrest and says, let's arm you and we can make a bunch of money because we, you know, we can sell you arms. And at some point, these countries decide when well, we don't want to kill each other, maybe we want to be a seller of uh, you know, a seller of goods and have some sort of stability. Enter China, right? We don't care what you do. We don't care who you are, but we've been smart enough. And this is why I think every Canadian, everybody that listens, no matter where you're listening from, you have to understand China's Belt and Road Initiative, where they are buying up all of these ports. And it's now not just the movement of their own goods. It's also about saying, we'll get into a financial deal with with you. Um, that's certainly great for us because we're, you know, we can, uh, we can assume more of the, more of the risk. Um, but if you want out of the deal, it will totally destabilize you, right? There's no countries that want out of belt and rail. Like if Pakistan decided they want to want it out of the, the, the belt and road initiative with China, they'd be bankrupt. Like, so yeah. they're pretty beholden, but China has been smart enough to say, well, we'll also move your goods which means we're going to bring a commerce infrastructure you've never had. And we're going to make it a legitimate commerce commerce infrastructure because we're China and we know how to move shit around the world. And we can um, do it we cheaply to too. Our stuff. But we're also going to do our stuff and we have the financial reach and, and all of the ability to do it. And what you're going to see is you're going to see the African nations, specifically Northern Africa say, I'm going to do that deal. I'm going to do that deal. This is going to bring, bring prosperity. And the question then becomes, what does Russia want to do about that? And this, I think, is this quintessential equation around, like, I know you've introduced this by saying, like, Canada needs to pay attention. Canada has no dog in this fight. This is it, between, oh. no way, this is between China. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? Send peacekeepers in there? Yeah, let's send, we didn't want to send peacekeepers last time. So you send peacekeepers into the middle of China, Russia, and the United States. We are crazy to do that. This is not our dog and this is not our fight. And if the U.S. wants to get into it, best of luck to them. This isn't our fight, but we have a long line of history, going back to Mike Pearson, God bless him, of being the intermediator. intermediator. No, no. Yes. How did that work out with Meng? We had two Michaels that we couldn't get out and we had to just sign God only knows what yeah, deal. Okay, okay, but we're, we're talking out. that Justin Trudeau is going to be the leader for a long period of time. It's not going to happen. We need a competent person in there to start being an intermediator. And that's why I'm pissed off with the Jolie appointment. At the end of the day, this is why. Because Mark Garneau could have been that person who could have negotiated things. I, I know you think Joe Biden did a lot more to get the Michaels out. I think Mark Garneau was the sane, reasonable person in the room who was actually having the adult conversation. With nothing to offer. I mean, you can be the adult in the room, but if you have nothing to offer, you're just the adult in the room. But he, at least we have an adult in the room. Like that's where I'm getting at is we don't have, we don't even have an adult in the room and like we're playing go fish while the world is playing fucking like, Texas hold them like we, we we are so dropping the ball on foreign affairs I would I would counter with you know if we're going to talk about foreign affairs I would counter with the fact that as the world as the planet gets warmer the northwest passage up to the arctic of Canada is warming which would do nothing but stop you know Russian tankers and Russian icebreakers from all of a sudden showing up one day and saying we're gonna we're gonna lay down some roots here in these oil reserves and what do we have one guy one guy defending that whole border. Like we also have to make sure that we're taking good care of our domestic issues. Like what foreign things could happen on our own soil. I just think if you have to decide between having an, having an Arctic strategy and having to decide what to do about Africa, which has been destabilized for forever. I just think I do, I do not I do not think it is appropriate for Canada to have any dog in a fight between Russia and China and the United States. I think Yikes. 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 I, uh, we, we agree on so much, but we, we always find a way to disagree on something. We always find I, a I, way. But I, I will agree that we do need to worry about the Arctic. I just, Canada used to be so great at being able to. Yeah, multi, we did. We did. We won the Nobel Peace for, <laughs> we use it, and we won the Nobel Peace Prize for peacekeeping yeah. in a world where there's no more value for peacekeeping. Exactly. We seem to want to bomb everyone. So I, 
I know I've sworn a lot during this episode. I know I've probably <laughs> yelled a lot in this episode, but I say this to the people who are listening. We can do better. We should demand better of our government, of our elected representatives of the world. And we need to start holding people account. We need to start asking the tough questions. And if we don't, where is this going to get us in five, 10 years? Like, okay, we have this pipe dream that we're going to be net zero by 2050. Where's the roadmap? Where's the, where, where's the actual instructions of A, B, C, and D to get to this point? Mike Pearson, Paul Martin did that. Paul Martin said, we're going to balance the budget and this is how we're going to do it. And he did it. He showed a roadmap to do it and he did it. We don't have a roadmap and we are working on a wing and a prayer. And our media and our attention span has become so diluted that we are no longer even caring about what's going on in the world. Yes, we need to worry about what's happening domestically, but we, we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And that's where I'm just, I'm fed up with our society that thinks that we need to worry about nothing but the me factor. It has to be about me. If it doesn't affect me, I don't care. And we need to get away from that. There's my well, I mean, TED talk I, for this episode. Yes, it was great. As always, they always are. I just think that I think we have to ask ourselves what we are going to do as a civic society. Like, what are yeah. we going to do as the third branch of this? You know, people have been asking me, like, you know, how do we fix this? And it starts by saying, like, why, why did it take so long for the prime minister to convene parliament? I don't want to be part of a party that I don't want to be part of a society that thinks that that's not acceptable. Parliament is our best chance at democracy and parliament needs to be meeting. And, and to the fact that they, we had an election and then didn't meet now we're, they're going to meet for what, four weeks. And then we're going to be done for another two months. Like we have, we have serious problems to solve and we need serious people to solve them. And we need the voice of we need the voice of our MPs to be heard in concert, even if they're just screaming at each other. You know, if you are conservative and you're listening to me speaking on this podcast, if you don't like what Denise Batters has done in terms of challenging Aaron O'Toole at a time where the, that is not the point of the leadership, that is the point, then you let her know and you let your party know. If even if you've even if you never intend to vote green, buy a Green Party membership and say to the Green Party, we have never had a greater challenge right now than climate change. Why are you guys bitching at each other and not getting on tap with a pragmatic plan that Canadians? can be proud of and then selling that plan to levels of government that can buy it. I think that it, it becomes beholden. And if you have really articulate friends and really smart friends, encourage them to run door knock for them, encourage them to find a level of government where they can effectuate their change and, and encourage them, encourage them to, to be a voice of, of, of making change from the inside. I think at, at the end of the day, this has to be scaled by us now. I was going to end on Latin America, but I'm not going to, because I think that was the best way to end the show. And I will say, the only thing I'll just say is uh, there's four elections happening over the next few months in Latin America. Chile's happening on Sunday, happened on Sunday. So uh, just as much as we love to talk about domestic politics, look what's happening across the world as well as uh, Jen chugs her big giant chocolate milk. <laughs> It's the biggest chocolate milk, but it expires today. So oh, you're just I down mean, and that. there's the milk cartel. So the dairy <laughs> cartel, I'm supporting the Canadian dairy cartel. Um, with that, as always, I want to thank our guests for coming in and sitting down and doing this. It's always lively debate on the cross border interview podcast. When Jen Sanford comes around, Jen, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. We'll see you next month. Yes, which will be actually in a few weeks because uh, we're off for the last weeks of December. But uh, as anyone who's listened to the show before, you know what I'm about to say. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to any of the podcast channels where you're listening to this right now. But also, if you want to keep independent journalism alive and doing well, which is going to be a big announcement on 20, January 2nd, 2022, please tune in. Uh, go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash crossborder interviews. Donate three, five, ten dollars $10 a month, depending on how much you can. And it will help the show continue. So with that, 
Have yourself an excellent rest of your Tuesday. Keep talking. And uh, we will be back in literally three weeks uh, to recap the biggest international news of 2021. So with that, my name is Christopher Brown, your host. Have yourself an excellent Tuesday, guys. Bye.